Welcome back. Today's lecture is over China. This is chapter 12 in your red and black world civilization book. The best way to learn new things is to activate your prior knowledge. This means to go back into your mind and find connections to things you already know. So since today's lecture is on China, let's look back at some of the dynasties we have covered since the first week of school. The first dynasty is the Xia dynasty, and we talked about how the Xia dynasty was uh, a Chinese myth. If you ask a, a Chinese person, they would probably say that it's uh, historically true, although historians um, in the rest of the world would say that it is a myth. The next dynasty was the Shang dynasty. The Shang dynasty, you need to associate it with the Hongho Yellow River Valley, um, which are the river valley civilizations that we spent several weeks over. The next dynasty was the Zhou dynasty. Um, you need to know political legitimacy. They derived their power from the Son of Heaven, also known as divine power. In between the Zhou dynasty and the Qin dynasty, you have the warring states. This was a period of chaos and a lot of bloodshed, and many families were killed. Qin Dynasty, uh, we talked a lot about Qin Shi Hongdi. Uh, remember, he's the one that was buried with the 6,000 terracotta soldiers. And then you also have legalism. And we had to find that as being very strict laws. Uh, Han Dynasty uh, changes from legalism to Confucianism. Keep in mind that a peasant is the one who led the revolt and, and started the new dynasty. And you also have paper making during the Han Dynasty. Here is a worldwide timeline uh, that coincides with what was going on with the transitions and the dynasties. You'll notice that during the Han Dynasty is uh, when the Roman Empire is just starting. If you look at the Warring States, that's when the Fall of Rome occurs. We had talked about the decline of classical civilizations declining uh, almost at the same time. You have the collapse of Gupta, India, the collapse of Han China, and the collapse of Rome, and the collapse of the Mayans all relatively in the same time period. During the beginning of the Tang Dynasty, if you look over in Southwest Asia, you'll see the rise of Islam and the uh, spread of the Arab uh, conquest. Um, and then you'll have the Song Dynasty, and then uh, we're not covering the Yuan Dynasty or the Ming Dynasty yet, but you can see how we will need to cover a few more dynasties in order to catch up to where we are in Europe, which is uh, the fall of the Byzantine Empire in 1453 with the invasion of the Ottoman Turks. If you notice uh, one date you're probably familiar with, Columbus sails to the New World, 1492. Uh, if I, I would pause this and um, really understand this timeline. So I had just mentioned the fall of the classical periods. Um, after the fall of the classical periods, you have the rise of the post-classical period. So we must ask ourselves what defined the post-classical period in Asia. And one key term is consolidation. Uh, another is technological innovations. Um, China's sphere of influence over Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and other parts of Southeast Asia made them very isolated, more so than the Islamic world and India. This map illustrates the spread of Chinese influence uh, circa 600 to 1400 CE. Notice uh, all the arrows are coming out of China. You have some arrows going to Korea. You're having some cross the East China Sea to Japan. And then you have some going to uh, an area uh, known today as Vietnam. Um, pause this slide so you can take a look at what um, e ideas, what commodities were being traded. After the fall of the Han Dynasty, uh, China has a time period known as the Era of Division from 220 to 589 CE. And what is um, common during this time period is a lot of regional kingdoms are fighting each other. And many areas are ruled by non-Chinese nomads, particularly from uh, north of China. You also have the spread of Buddhism. Keep in mind, Buddhism came from India. And Buddhism was a foreign religion, and it weakened the, the local religion, which was Confucianism. You also have widespread invasions. 
trade and quality of life declines, and there is less technological innovation occurring. The Sui Dynasty will be the one to bring China out of the era of division, and it reunifies China after three and a half centuries of regionalism. And the Sui Dynasty's uh, time period is 589 to 618. Notice that this is a relatively short time period. And one way that it reunified China is by lowering taxes and um, building widespread granaries. Granaries is where you take to um, grind up your grains. Uh, the Sui Dynasty expanded its borders. It laid the foundation for future great powers. And it reestablished a central empire. Um, we, ca we call this process bureaucratic reconstruction. Um, because there a bureaucracy is uh, departments of government, and so they're having to redefine how they're going to set up their government. The Sui dynasty favored the landed aristocracy over the scholar gentry. The landed aristocracy, think of that as being uh, people who are born wealthy, owning land. Scholar gentry are those, then they could also be born wealthy, but they're those who are well-educated. Um, there's also legal and education reform. Um, and then there's a decline um, because of luxurious and extravagant projects, unsuccessful in regaining Korea. They also uh, almost lost to the Turks in South Asia. And all of these things weakened the empire. And many people were afraid to go back to the state of turmoil that had been evident during the era of division. Okay, here's a map of the Shui Dynasty, uh, and it overlaps modern-day China's uh, political boundaries. So here's the Shui Dynasty, and if you look up here to the north where Mongolia is, this is where most of the non-Chinese nomads uh, were invading from. And so, as you can tell, they had quite a route to make it to the Shui Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty follows the Shui Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty is going to last a lot longer than the Shui. Uh, Tang will last 618 to 907. Uh, founder of the Tang Dynasty is Li Yuan. And he worked with nomads, uh, the non-Chinese that were ruling the frontier. Um, and he was able to rule Vietnam, Manchuria, and Korea, which was at the time known as Shila. Um, and China was able to force its neighbors into tributary system, and the economy was strong, and he was able to rebuild the bureaucracy by reviving the scholar gentry. Uh, remember I had said under the Shui, the landed aristocracy was able to rule over the scholar gentry. You also had the revival of Confucian ideals. Remember, Confucianism has a lot to do with education. And so the scholar gentry who are, who are the ones who are educated are going to um, push for uh, Confucian ideals. The bureaucracy is divided into six departments, and they have Department of War and Department of Justice, uh, similar to what we have today. They also have county-like districts, uh, and they also have a Bureau of Censors. And these were people who would track officials to make sure that they were doing their job. Here's a map of the Tang Dynasty. It is larger than the Sui Dynasty. And here's a nicer map, um, which has both the Sui and the Tang Dynasty. And you can also um, relate them in comparison to the present day borders of China. Press pause so that you can uh, browse the image for uh, major capitals and major cities. One social aspect of the Tang Dynasty is the revival of the civil service exams. Um, these are based on Confucian uh, morals and organized principles that if a man is able to pass a very difficult test, then he should be able to have a position in the Chinese government. And the gaining the high office was known as Jinshi, and once they would pass, they were ranked again based on their test average. And uh, established families still had prominence, and they could also um, d get bribes and uh, get uh, retakes on the exams. 
Keep in mind that Buddhism was still around, and uh, it had now become a threat to both the state and the religion of Confucianism um, because it increased uh, patronage for Confucian learning. Buddhism threatened the state as the old aristocracy would lose power uh, because the monasteries had certain rules about what the government could tell them and not tell them. And it increased during wartime. And this was actually an, a past AP essay question about the spread of Buddhism. And one thing you should know is that all religions are easily accepted during time of turmoil. Now, there's two types of Buddhism. Mahayana, which most of the peasants uh, were this type of Buddhist, and this is focused on salvation. Um, and then upper class were usually Zen Buddhists, which focused, focused on meditation and beauty. If you look at the image in the center of this uh, slide, you can see the beautiful rock garden, which uh, epitomizes the Zen Buddhism. If you look at the bottom corner, you see an image of Empress Wu. She ruled from 640 to 705, and she wanted Buddhism as the official religion, and she is responsible for the many giant Buddha carvings throughout China. And then following her, there is a Buddhist backlash, and Taoism is on the rise uh, because of its appeal with magic and fortune-telling. There's also a push of Confucian Confucianism by the scholar Gentry, um, and there's also economic reasons that people didn't want um, Buddhism to continue because they didn't pay taxes and because um, they were not giving uh, labor to the state. Okay. Decline of the tongue. And so uh, there's this attack on Buddhism and Empress Wu's son is poisoned by his wife. And another prince uh, steps in to take power, known as Xuanzang, and his reign was 713 to 756, and his reign is actually the peak of the Tang. So the peak is actually right near the decline. Uh, and one of the reasons for the decline is he was distracted by his favorite concubine. Concubine is a mistress. And uh, he was later executed by rebels. She was executed by rebels. And nomads invade during the decline as well, causing many revolts. During this time period, there's a lot of uh, economic trade occurring. And um, sometimes the AP exam likes to ask these questions. This is known as the Indian Ocean Network. And if you notice that a lot of commodities are coming out of India and coming out of Indonesia. And uh, what's going to come out of Indonesia is the spices. Um, go through the list, press pause, and make sure that you know um, what goods are coming in and out of which countries. Here's another map illustrating um, the trade routes, but this one is um, more visible of an overland trade route. And this is known as the Silk Road. The last dynasty we will talk about today is Song China, and it's the longest lasting um, empire of the three, and it never matched the military or political strength of the Tang, and it was also smaller in size. It was the world's most heavily urbanized society. Uh, remember, urbanized means cities, um, and it's known for their outstanding technology and scientific contributions. Under Song China, the military was purposely made weak to prevent takeovers. Once again, there's a revival of the civil service exams and a push for Confucianism, uh, which was renewed by the scholar gentry. Um, they built new schools, new libraries, and then there's a rise of Neo-Confucianism, uh, which helped to revive Confucianism. And Neo-Confucianist ultimate goals were to cultivate personal morality. So keep in mind how Confucianism is more like a philosophy rather than a religion uh, because it seeks to regulate one's behavior. And now we move into the decline of the Song Dynasty. Uh, one of the reoccurring things that we have talked about are nomads. 
uh, to the north of China. And so nomads continue to set up new kingdoms along China's northern frontier, and China pays them tribute, uh, which is like a peace offering so that they won't invade and take over Song China. And the group of people, you might be surprised, that are responsible for paying the tribute were the peasants. The peasants uh, had to pay high taxes. Keep in mind that the scholar gentry and the aristocracy are living a life of luxury. Um, they have a one million man army, which is also paid by the peasants and worked by the peasants. Um, Wang tries to save the song by taxing the wealthy, forcing the wealthy to work, and reviving legalism. Um, so what's going to happen is parts of Song China is going to be taken over and it's going to uh, be condensed into the Southern Song Dynasty, which will be the years 1127 to 1279, uh, while the rest, the northern uh, half, is taken by nomads. Uh, but finally in 1279, one of the northern invaders, the Mongols, will capture um, all of China. In fact, they will take all of the Asian landmass. Now that we're at the end of the dynasty, so let's go ahead and take a look back and let's pull out some of the important um, concepts, concepts and themes you should have uh, picked up on. Um, we talked a lot about technology, and so here's one example of technology under China during the Tang and the Song is the building of the Grand Canal. And the Grand Canal was a uh, canal that connected the... Yangtze River to the Yellow River. Remember, the Yellow River is where the Shang Dynasty, uh, the river valley was. And they were transferring rice and millet from the south to the north. And then this also increased migration. So who was China trading with? They were trading with the Muslims. Remember, the Arab Muslims are second best to China. Uh, they were also trading with the Persians, um, nomads in Central Asia, um, Chinese had the best ships. They were called junks, and believe it or not, they had rockets because the Chinese had already developed gunpowder. Um, and so the Chinese, in fact, are the first ones to have rockets, um, guns, and grenades. Um, under the Tang, they also start paper money and banks. And keep in mind, in the post-classical period in Europe, under the Middle Ages, they are also having uh, early capitalism as well. We talked about the rise of cities, uh, which we call urbanization, and two main cities during this time period is Shang'an and Hangzhou. Shang'an had a population of 2 million, and it's the imperial city. Um, Hangzhou had 1.5 million. It was very clean, and the famous traveler Marco Polo uh, said of it, it was the most beautiful in the world. Um, and China had the biggest cities until after the Industrial Revolution. So we're looking at all the way up until about the year 1800. Under these dynasties, uh, farm, farming also flourished because they encouraged settlement in unusual areas. They also spe had specialized crops uh, such as soybeans, and they also adopted new crops such as champa rice from Vietnam. Uh, and then they also invented new technology such as the wheelbarrow. Um, one other thing that they did, and was probably because of all the revolts, is they broke up these greater estates of the, of the powerful landed aristocracy and gave it to the peasants, known as redistribution of land. Uh, under technology, so there's the canals, we talked about the Grand Canal, there's also dikes and dams, uh, invention of gunpowder, we have already went over that. Um, but it is notable to point out that gunpowder was originally used starting with the Han Dynasty for fireworks, but it wasn't fully refined until um, later in the Tang and the Song Dynasty uh, for weapons. The Celestial Clock of Susung, if you look at the image on the right, was also invented during this time period. Uh, block printing with movable type was invented, and this means that you could... Um, move out metal parts so that you can um, print fa uh, more papers at, at a quicker rate. Uh, but it, it was not the same as the printing press that would come out in, Germ in uh, Germany. 
Um, also, the Song period was the golden age of literature and art. I've mentioned the scholar gentry several times during this lecture. Um, remember, they are the educated upper class, and their life focused on music and on paintings, poetry, and literature, specifically short stories. If you look at the image on the right, they were known for monochrome um, paintings. Now let's talk about women in Chinese society. So women in China were better off than those in India, um, and they could have power, and they were able to divorce. However, uh, foot binding became very popular, um, and we'll talk about that more in a second. Also, Neo-Confucianism, um, when we had said that the new push for Confucianism focusing on behavior reaffirmed male dominance, we call that patriarchy, and confined women to the home, and women were not allowed to uh, participate in civil service or in politics. Here are some images of foot binding. Um, and the way that this would work is um, when a child was around the age of four or five, the mother would break all of the child's toes, um, bend them backwards, and wrap them really tight with bandages. And the point of this was for the women to have a foot between three and five inches um, because men in the time period had like small feet and if you were going to marry uh, into a powerful family you would have to have small feet. Um, one of the consequences of this is that many women and small girls could not walk and they had to be carried but that was also symbolic of uh, being upper class because you had to be lifted into the air and you couldn't uh, do um, certain types of work like farming. And so foot binding um, re restricted Chinese women. One of the essays you will have to write in May on the AP exam is the Continuity and Change Over Time essay known as the CCOT, uh, which we haven't went into uh, detail yet. But I, I want to start pointing out how to think historically. So some continuity in China are uh, key ideas, institutions, and patterns of political and social organization. Some changes are balances between regions, level of commercial development. Obviously in the song there is a massive growth in the economic sector. Uh, level of urban development as well. And we talked about the two cities um, that represented this growth. Technology, um, increased political power and social power, the scholar gentry, and weakening of the landed aristocracy. Um, and so um, you should relook at this PowerPoint, uh, maybe without the lecture, looking for the continuity and change as you go. That's all for today.